welcome to another virtual recorded edition of I've Heard of Her. Today we are going to talk about Artemisia Gentileschi. She was a Baroque painter, so we are going to 17th century Europe. Very exciting. Uh, before we do that though, let's introduce ourselves. My name is Samantha Mahalik. I am the registrar here at the Civil War Museum. We're part of the Kenosha Museum campus, which is three museums, the Civil War, Kenosha Public Museum, and Dinosaur Discovery Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, I am part of the uh, exhibits and collections department. Um, I help with the care and management of the collections, so it's really exciting that I get to share my research with all of you today. <laughs> um, and then I have my lovely co-host here. Hi everybody, I'm Caitlin Mannering. I'm the Education Services Coordinator here for the Kenosha Museum campus. That means I'm the lady in charge of bringing all those smiling groups of school kids into the building, you know, when we're not in a plague. <laughs> you know. Um, so it's nice to get a chance to do some teaching while we're mostly, you know, virtual and stuff. So nice to see you guys, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, before we start, we have a little bit of a warning, just because we're going to talk about some heavy stuff today. Yeah, so during this program, we are going to be talking about rape and torture. Um, it's not going to be very detailed, and it's going to be a very short part of the presentation. But unfortunately, Artemisia had a very traumatic experience early in her life. She went on to do amazing, incredible things that we're going to talk about too, and she was much bigger than this experience. But it did impact her artistic style, and it was a significant event in her life. So we will be talking about it. Yep. All right. So, Caitlin, take it away. Yeah. So, her early life, what we know about it, since it is the 1600s, or the 16th century, anyway. Um, she was born July 8th, 1593, in Rome, which at the time was part of the Papal States. So Italy, at this moment in history, wasn't really Italy. Um, it had a lot of different duchies principalities and things all competing with one another. It was constantly changing and really complicated, but suffice to say, for right now, Rome was the Papal States. Um, she, Artemisia, was one of five children and the only girl. Her mother, Prudentia, died when she was 12 years old, so she really grew up surrounded by boys. Um, her father, Orazio, was a big painter, and he was kind of a big deal because he studied under an even bigger deal painter, Caravaggio, um, who we'll talk about on the next slide. Her father actually painted this picture here, which is the Virgin Mary with the baby Jesus and some saints. Mm -hmm. So, just to give a short overview of Baroque art, just so you know what we're talking about, um, Baroque art is all about drama. Rich, bright, bold colors, textures. Um, the paintings have a ton of movement. Um, Caravaggio is credited with really starting this era of painting in Europe. Um, and it's also defined by chiaroscuro, um, which is the dramatic use of light. It, it puts a, a, almost like a spotlight on certain er areas of the painting, leaving others in darkness, giving it a big sense of drama as well. Um, it's also often criticized at this time for being too lifelike um, because the subject matter was often historical and religious. Um, people wanted their saints to be seen as pious, but Caravaggio especially is best known for going to like brothels and bars to find subjects for his paintings. People were not happy to see, you know, saints being portrayed by bar patrons. Um, but he did start a European-wide trend called Caravaggioism. He inspired other masters like Peter Paul Rubens and Rembrandt. Um, despite this, not a great guy, small aside. Um, he's accused of several assaults and even a murder. His death in 1610 is suspicious. Um, he died of a fever, which could have been malaria or possibly syphilis related, or it could have been he was poisoned by his enemies. We don't know. <laughs> Despite that, beautiful art changed European art for the 17th century. So, um, Artemisia is growing up surrounded by paintings and painters. Her father, as I said, was a big painter himself, and the tradition at the time was for established artists to train younger artists who want to go on to do big things. So he had several students, and at the time he was training a man named Agnostino Tassi, um, 
he hadn't planned on teaching, Ar Ar teaching <laughs> Artemisia because she was a girl and he had expected her to have her go into a convent and become a nun. However, she was crazy good at it and it no longer became possible to ignore that. So he started teaching her himself. At the beginning, her work was very similar to his because, you know, she was his student. Um, but she was so good from very early on that some of her earliest paintings were confused with his. So this one right here, Suzanne and the Elders, for a very, very long time, people thought her father had done this painting, but it's actually the earliest known work that we have by her. Mm -hmm. So thinking for a minute, she's like an early teenager, and she's already painting as well as her father, who's made an entire life career out of it. It's a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, so we're going to talk about this. Like we said before, brief, not too detailed, but it is important. Um, as... Caitlin just said, one of her student, father's students was um, Agostino Tassi. He was a landscape painter. And unfortunately, in 1611, when Artemisia was 17 years old, Tassi um, raped her. At the time, you the rapist could almost be absolved of his crime if he would marry his victim. Um, Tassi refused to marry her. Uh, which Orazio took as a slight on their family's honor, so Tassie was brought to trial. So, um, to make things worse, trials, even now, for these sort of crimes, people are very hesitant to participate in because it's such a raw emotional experience and can be really humiliating. Back then, you also had to undergo torture when you were giving your evidence because that was considered the only way to prove that what you were saying was true. Um, so she had to undergo something called thumb screws during her presentation of evidence, um, which is just a device that applies really intense pressure to your, your thumbs. Um, it goes around them and, uh, excruciating stuff. She was recorded as shouting across the courtroom to Tassie that, uh, this is the ring that you give me and these are your promises. Um, he was found guilty of his crimes, however, he was supposed to be exiled from Rome, but because he had really close connections with the papal court, he was never actually punished for his crime. He continued to live his life, even though he was found guilty. Um, mm -hmm. That's all we're going to talk about about it here. It was very well documented, though, so if you would like to learn more about what happened, um, there is information on it online. Mm -hmm. so. So, um, as you might expect, this um, experience had a deep effect on her and on her art. Um, she painted her first version of this painting, Judas slaying Holofernes, in um, 1612 to 13. Um, she paints another one in 1620. Um, quick overview, if you don't know the story of Judas, um, it's in the Catholic Bible, but it's not in Jewish and Protestant um, traditions. They say it's apocryphal, meaning they don't know if it's authentic or not. So, might, you might never have heard it. So, just a quick rundown. Judas, um, she was a Judas, uh, Jewish widow in Bethulia. Uh, Holofernes was an Assyrian general who had been besieging the city. Uh, Judas got real dressed up one night um, to go to the camp to try and give Holofernes some false information and hurt his cause because her city is being besieged. Uh, Holofernes saw how beautiful she was and decided that he was going to invite her to dinner to seduce her. The thing, the problem with his plan was um, he got like blackout pass out drunk during this dinner because I, he was nervous, <laughs> unsure. <laughs> But she decided to use this to her advantage, and when he was passed out, um, she prayed to God for strength and killed him. Um, she chopped his head off. So, this is Artemisia's first rendering of the ta moment in time where Holofernes is being killed. <laughs> um, so... Caravaggio also had painted a version of this in 1598, um, which we have a side-by-side. -side. Caravaggio's Judith and Artemisia's Judith are very different figures. 
Artemisia painted Judith as very sure, very strong. Um, Caravaggio is more delicate, more unsure, more a little kind stricken of by yeah, what he has stricken to do. and you know, kind of guilty for killing someone. Yeah. Um, in addition, Artemisia's uh, Judith has a very strong helpmate, which I'll go back to Caravaggio's. Uh, her maidservant is very old in the full painting. She's just holding a basket. She's removed from the scene where hers is actually helping Judith. She's holding hold of her knees down, giving her assistance to in her task. And it's some scholars argue that this is because um, Artemisia's female chaperone actually colluded with Cassie during the attack and left her alone, so Artemisia had no one to help her. And so in this painting, Judith has someone to help her, and they're very strong and sure um, in, their, in their task. All right, so not too long after all of these events occur, um, Artemisia gets married, and I'm gonna totally butcher the name of the guy she married, so full disclosure. Uh, Pier Antonio di Vicenzo Striatezzi. Um, and the couple moved to his home in Florence. So they had five kids in five years, which is nuts. It's a lot. Um, though only one of them would actually live past early adulthood, a daughter, which um, Artemisia named for her mother, Prudentia. Um, during this time in Florence, Artemisia is moving from imitating the sort of painting style that her father had taught her to really developing this bold, unique take of her own. She's heavily influenced by Florentine fashion and culture and some of the clothing that girls are wearing around the streets she's including in her paintings. Um, and then she starts to get really noticed for this amazing new painting still that she has and she actually becomes the first person invited by the de' Medici family, which is a big deal, um, as a female to join the Institute of Art and Design mm -hmm. in 1616. So another big thing about her art style is that a lot of women at the time were really just sticking to landscapes and still life because it was considered more delicate and feminine and safe. She went hard <laughs> and did a lot of portraiture and strong female figures from history and um, you know biblical stories. Um, and she liked to use herself as a model for a lot of these. One big reason why she might have wanted to do that is that she could have had a connection with this. Um, an example of like a character that she might have been connected with is the one that we see her depicted as here, which is St. Catherine of Alexandria. Um, she's a pretty commonly known saint. A lot of people are named for her back mm -hmm. then. Um, and her story, in case you don't know it, I'll run through. So Catherine was from the 4th century. She was a martyr. Um, we think she was some sort of royalty, though we're not exactly sure what kind or to what extent. Um, and she converted to Christianity when she was a teenager. She begins to speak out against the Emperor Maximus, and that is not something that he's a fan of. So um, he gets really mad and he hires this whole team of philosophers to like corner her and argue against her beliefs, but supposedly she converts them all because she's just awesome. Um, after that, he imprisons her because he can't have her talking about this sort of thing, but people hear her story and they come visit her and are still talking to her and still learning all of this stuff. So finally, he decides that he's either going to marry her or get rid of her. So he proposes to her and she says, no, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And so he sends her to be executed by like the studded wheel, which I'm not entirely sure how that works, but sounds awful. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she supposedly though touches the wheel and miraculously it just completely falls to pieces. Um, and then he just cuts her head off. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's this story of a powerful woman with lots to say um, being tortured and silenced by a man. And so there's reason to think that Artemisia might have been really connected to this story. So it's possible that she had connections to a lot of these figures that she painted herself as. However, it's also <laughs> just a really famous story um, and people like to buy stories paintings about stories that they know. Mm -hmm. And it's cheaper to not have to hire other people to be your model. And being a woman, um, 
her self-portraits just sold for better money. Um, so Charles I of England actually had three. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of financial incentive to doing it too. It's hard to say for sure why. Exactly. Um, but, you know, she's a strong, independent woman, right? Um, in 1616, she, well, she was in Florence. She was actually commissioned by um, Michelangelo Buonarroti. We're going to go with that. The Younger, <laughs> as a part of a series of paintings um, celebrating the work of his uncle, the Michelangelo. Um, so she uh, painted the Allegory of Inclination at their house in Florence. Um, by 1620, the family had moved back to Rome. Most likely, they were fleeing predators. Her husband was not a good guy. Um, he kind of just went around the town gambling, spending all their money, and having affairs. So yeah. they fled Florence, went back to Rome, and just a little story of, you know, how not great a guy he was. In 1622, Pier Antonio, he came home, and he found a group of Spaniards standing on their ste doorstep, serenading his wife. He became so enraged that he took out a knife and ended up slicing one of them on the face. Um, so, you know, uh, <laughs> he can have all the affairs he wants, but Spaniards sing to Singing his wife. To you? Violence. Um, he eventually leaves them, both Artemisia and Prudentia, not long after this incident. Um, and so Artemisia, for the rest of her life, is, is essentially a single mother. Does not stop her, however. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, not too long after, she just starts traveling the world, practicing her art. So in 1628, she goes to Venice. And as you've mentioned, kind of with Michelangelo's family, she's starting to get some really uh, big attention from big people. Mm -hmm. um, her commission in Venice is from none other than King Philip IV of Spain. Um, and she's commissioned to paint a companion piece to um, Peter Paul Rubens and Anthony von Dyck's um, Discovery of Achilles. So she's painting with the big boys for the big boys. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, she would go on also to visit London and spend a lot of time in the English court. She traveled there with her father, which was really interesting because they hadn't actually seen each other for 17 years. Uh, so, you know, um, they had originally not planned to go. Uh, Charles I had invited them, but, um, you know, she's already painted for a king, and he's only a Protestant. And she's not sure how she feels about that, so she says no the first time. So <laughs> pretty cool when you're cool enough that you can just be like, no, your majesty, I don't want to paint for you. <laughs> um, she did eventually go over, though, because she needed the money, and with her father, she painted this immaculate ceiling mm -hmm. um, to what at the time was the Queen's house. It's now Marlborough, Ho Marlborough House in London. Um, and they painted it together, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, also around the time, she painted the portrait you see in the corner, which is herself as an allegory of painting. It has a lot of really cool dynamic parts to it. Um, allegory painting had very strict rules for like iconography mm -hmm. and like things that you had to do to represent this figure. And painting itself could only be um, described as a woman. It had to have tussled hair and bright fabric dress and all these things to define, you know, the artistic part of painting. So she could encapsulate herself as a representation of something that a lot of women were not able to join traditionally, and mm -hmm. also that men couldn't couldn't do this themselves because they couldn't paint themselves as a woman. Exactly. Um, so this is. The end of her life is a little unknown, unfortunately. Um, by 1630, she had settled in Naples. Um, she fled the plague in Venice, uh, which was probably a good idea. That plague killed one-third of the population there, so it was a bad one. Um, Naples was ruled by Spain at the time, um, so she had that connection through King Philip. Uh, she ran a successful studio there until her death, which is how she made money. Um, and she also is recognized how her gender constrained her at the time. Um, this article had a quote, um, You feel sorry for me because a woman's name raises doubts until her work is seen. If I were a man, I can't imagine it would have turned out that way. 
So even at the time, and she's doing all of these grand pieces for big people, she's recognizing that if she were a man, she would probably be even bigger than she was. Um, and then, like I said, this is kind of where details of her life stop. Um, her father died in 1639. Seems like she stayed in London a little longer than that, 1640, 1641, where she returned to Naples. Um, she originally was thought to have died in like 1652, 53, but now recently, in the past year or so, a letter had come to light which puts her alive in August of 1654. So we we don't know. We, she was running a studio sometime after 1654. She passed away. Um, and like the end of her life, her work kind of also wasn't appreciated um, like it should have been at the end. Um, her first solo show was only this past October, October yeah. 2020 through January 2021, um, at the... National Gallery in London was her first solo show. Usually she's shown alongside of her father, if she's shown at all. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a unsatisfying ending, but that's it. Um, we do have a fun question, which is, <laughs> if you could have your portrait done by Artemisia, how might you want to be portrayed? Caitlin? Oh, I gotta say, some of the fabrics that she shows are just immaculate oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so I would like a very fancy dress just Ooh. like completely over the top um, and I'd like to be surrounded by books because books are the best I like yeah, it I think that would be my vote I like it <laughs> I think I would like to be one of those saints I think that'd yeah. be fun uh -huh. yeah be a cool saint I don't know which saint but I, I yeah. think that'd be fun anyway <laughs> let us know what what you would like to be painted as and just before we go, we have a big announcement. Next month, we are coming back live on Zoom. Hey. So, <laughs> we will still be digital, but you'll be able to interact with us, which will be fun. Um, this program's been recorded for the past year, so I'm really excited to get back to hopefully having some of the discussions we were able to have when we were live in person. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing that eventually one day, but we still want everybody to stay safe. And so we're trying this. Um, you have to pre-register. Um, it's on our website under the events tab. Um, you have to reserve a spot. Spots are limited, so make sure you do that. As always, it's free, but donations are appreciated. Um, we are going to be talking about Mulan. Yes. <laughs> so it's going to be exciting. We'll see if she had a talking dragon friend. Unclear. So you'll have to join us to find out. Um, <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thanks for watching, guys. Bye.